Uh, my name is Uri and I'm the founder of a group called The Guild. I have short time, so I'll get right to it. We are a group that created GraphQL code generator, GraphQL inspector to compare schemas and validate before you go to production, uh, GraphQL CLI, GraphQL modules, and many other uh, community packages. Um, that we maintain and we try, strive to get like a very high level of maintenance of our open source libraries. And we combine them all because we use them as just building blocks for a complete platform for your uh, building your applications uh, using GraphQL. Um, so, but today I want to talk about a new library that we're very excited about and about that um, is called GraphQL Mesh. Um, so GraphQL is great. Um, GraphQL, you can query what you want. Uh, GraphQL uh, will get whatever it needs from your data sources and get you back uh, a predictable response. And one of the cool things about it is that the, um, the back and the resolvers, um, I know exactly in each resolver, we know what we're going to get from the parent resolver and what we need to return. So we can basically know those types and even generate um, typings for the inputs and the outputs of those uh, resolvers. Um, but one thing that we sometimes forget is that, yeah, we have type safety over the network, but what about all the data sources that we, uh, the old data sources that we keep on querying? Um, over there, let's say in the resolver, I'm calling some, you know, rest, the, the rest endpoints that I used to call before, I don't have types for it, so I have no idea what's coming. Um, and that can be a problem. Um, so now that we have GraphQL on the front end, what we can, what can we do to make the back end even better and all the interactions we have with it? Um, should we use GraphQL everywhere? I mean, one solution would be to basically build small GraphQL endpoints into those services, into those um, old backends and teach them GraphQL um, or federation. Uh, which can be nice, but you know, many times those are old servers, like an old Java server or .NET server. Uh, it's not maintained, or the people there won't get to learn GraphQL in the foreseeable future. Um, there's also other problems, but I don't have a lot of time to talk about it. Um, but what if, what do we really want from it? Like, what do we love about GraphQL that we want on the backend? Um, and that's probably the schema and the query language. Um, so, you know, what can we do with it? So we thought about it and we thought, well, those backends, they do send something and they do sometimes have schemas, even if it's not GraphQL. And in the past, we created a library called Sofa that took a similar concept where we took uh, an existing GraphQL uh, server and we generated a complete REST and open API server endpoints out of it to serve for third parties or like other applications that don't know GraphQL. So we thought, well, maybe into, in order to solve those problems, we can do the other way around. Maybe we can take those services, um, get their schemas, whether if they have it defined like gRPC or OpenAPI, or maybe we can just look at the logs and the, of the responses and generate schemas from there convert each one of those endpoints of those schemas into GraphQL and then even merge them into one single GraphQL endpoint that basically we can query for all of our sources that we need when we in, into our resolvers. Um, and what we've done here is basically if we'll do that we can take the best out of GraphQL using all the existing services we have today without needing to change them or touch them or them even know, being aware of what GraphQL is. And that's GraphQL Mesh. So GraphQL Mesh takes all those different sources, there's a lot of them, um, and generates a, a full, fully typed GraphQL SDK, which you can run anywhere. So basically it takes all those sources and merge them into one. Um, let's see an example. So this is a simple example where we have two public APIs, one cities, which is a REST API with Swagger, and another weather, which also is a public Swagger API. Um, so just by defining those two into our uh, mesh, uh, mesh uh, config, we can start querying it 
as it was GraphQL. That's it. And those are the, just the existing endpoint. We have full documentation, graphical, anything. But we, that's not where we want to stop. We also want to merge them. So we can add a new field called daily forecasts on a city. And in the, into those, uh, in those um, functions that we're connecting them both, it's complete, it's a, this function is completely typed uh, because we generate SDKs out of it. So now, just by defining this field, we can start querying uh, not only the city Tel Aviv, but also the forecast there. And what we've done here is basically schema stitching, not only on GraphQL, but on any source, um, which is extremely powerful. We can do schema stitching between OData and gRPC. We can do schema stitching between um, GraphQL and GraphQL Federation. And there's many, many sources that we already created and there's more coming. So uh, OpenAPI and Swagger, gRPC, SOAP, um, GraphQL Federation, Federated Services, and regular GraphQL, SQL, and more. Um, so just by trying to solve the problem of having full type safety over our resolvers, we basically solved a much bigger problem. Now GraphQL Mesh has much more into it. Those merging that I showed you, I showed you with, with stitching, which by the way, we took over schema stitching, improved it and released new versions to make it uh, undeprecated. But you can also use federation into, into doing those stitching. And more than that, we have an opportunity, we have a, a way for you to take existing services and even Swagger services and add federated metadata into it and then federate services that are not federated service that are not federation at all and there's many more things we can mock each one of those sources we can snapshot prefix do any transformation we want it's you want it's all pluggable uh, and the most exciting thing about mesh is that it's not a central gateway it can run as a central gateway but you can basically generate that sdk and runs it run it anywhere on each of your services so it's completely distributed. It can be like one central place or a distributed source. And if we take this idea one step further, we can actually start taking those codes that I showed you in the example, and you can start creating a weather API using GraphQL. And you can take your own uh, existing bank API and ex expose this as a public mesh module exposing GraphQL without the bank even knowing what GraphQL is. And now suddenly you can even expose the merging strategy of those. So now that your bank has a public GraphQL API that also shows the weather in each of those branches and the bank didn't do anything. You have, the community did. And if we take this one step further, that's basically means that now we can start having public mesh modules that run anywhere and are completely distributed. So we can have, and they're fully open source, this, the community is owning it, the registry can be any registry, NPM, GitHub, whatever, and we can really, that can take us closer to the web 3.0, semantic web. We can all start exposing data that is connected to each other without putting it all in a central place. So if that's interesting for you, then go to graphicalmesh.com and join the Guild community. We have discussions about it all the time, and we're moving for forward very fast. Thank you very much. Well, that's a lot of knowledge in just 20 or 28 minutes it was. Four great topics. Um, I, would, yeah, I would like to invite all the Lightning Talk speakers with me on the stage to do the last round of Q&A of the day. Hey, everyone. Hello. Hey there. Hey. Hello. Good morning, evening, night, whatever it is for you. Um, yeah, I'm going to go straight into the questions. Um, going to start with the first question for Matt McClure. What market are you targeting and why would someone use Mux instead of Twitch or YouTube? Yeah, it's a, it's a valid question. Um, we're, we're a developer facing product. So we're purely just APIs for developers to build into their platform, uh, as opposed to uh, Twitch and YouTube, which were which are much more consumer facing products. So uh, if you're a streamer just looking to go live, 
uh, without mm -hmm. writing any code whatsoever. Those are great platforms. You should probably use them. Uh, if you're trying to build a platform, uh, we're, we're probably a better fit there. Okay, so it's uh, it's more about the target audience, I guess, and that you have more control over what you're doing. Yeah, it's uh, I, would, I would think about it a little bit like um, uh, a bad analogy that I mentioned in Slack is uh, they're more like the PayPal or Venmo, uh, we're more the Stripe. If you're thinking okay. about it in terms of like payment APIs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is for Jen. What are the reasons why someone like the React Native web team would want to use a div as a button? Uh, the reason is that putting HTML inside of a button is not actually semantic HTML. So they may want to wrap mm -hmm. that content, for instance, a card or a block of like an image and text into a div and make that an accessible button instead of putting a button around it. Yeah, so if you have a completely clickable card with different elements inside it, you can do that semantically within a button. Correct. So in that case, you'll okay. want to make an accessible div. Well, you should want to, at least. <laughs> Perhaps. And, and can I say, if, if you don't, Jen is going, going to come and get you? I, I will very kindly tap you on the shoulder and yeah. make suggestions. How about that? Yeah. Yeah, but tap doesn't work. Uh, then I might go to the... it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not a question, but uh, just for Yuri, a nice tap on the shoulder from Martin van Houten. Not really a question. Just want to say, mesh, look, mesh looks awesome. Well, that's always nice to hear. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, I hope that after you Mark. try it, you feel the same and not uh, hate me. <laughs> well. Actually, at uh, the company I work for, Albert Hein, we are using it. And uh, I have to say, it's uh, been a pleasure. So thanks a lot. Oh, Don't you're tell my anyone neighbor. You're... I can uh, come visit you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, would be uh, gezellig. Uh, Mike, <laughs> does Ionic support native apps similar to React Native? Or is it like a Cordova standard app where it's a web UI instead of a native app? So it's kind of a mix of both, where you there the majority of the UI is displayed in a web view, but you can integrate with custom uh, native views or activities on Android, uh, and kind of mix which one gets displayed uh, at the web view or the native view, or even just overlay the native view on top of the web view. So you get kind of the best of both worlds. Hmm. It feels powerful. Um... Okay, thanks, thanks, guys, uh, and my lady, for these great talks. Um, for the people watching, they are also going to be in the Zoom rooms for uh, questions, but the formal part is now over. I'm going to say goodbye to you uh, for a little bit. So, thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.